Um, welcome to the uh, museum. My name is Stephanie Parrish. I am the Associate Director of Education and Public Programs here. Um, and as part of my job, I have the great privilege of working with um, the fabulous community of Portland and Oregon, the region really, um, to develop programs around our exhibitions. And as we were talking about the art of the Tuileries Gardens, uh, programming. It was an easy phone call over to the U of O and the School of Architecture and Allied Arts to begin discussions about what we could do together um, to really amplify the, the programming around the show. So with that, we kind of created a great um, realm or um, series of programs. Some of you may have participated in our conversation series with Randy Gregg, which um, is called Portland Parks. Um, past, present, and future. Did anybody come to those programs? I see a few hands. Those are all online now, so if you are interested in that topic, I really encourage you to, um, to look at them. We also hosted the U of O Design Camp here, um, which was great. We had high schoolers who were revisioning the South Park blocks, and we had models here on display um, a few weeks ago. We will have those same models on display next weekend when we host Paris in the Park Blocks, um, which will be an all weekend long um, series of events. I encourage you to come. Saturday, we have a plein air paint out out in the Park Blocks with over 40 of the region's great plein air artists. On Sunday, those artists will come back. They'll display the work that they painted the day before. It'll all be on view in the courtyard outside. We'll have art making for kids, music, food. Um, and then into the evening, if you stay, we are gonna have a screening of Gigi, um, the great 1958 uh, comedy, romantic comedy. And that is in partnership with our friends at the Portland Parks Department, who um, graciously are experimenting with us to see if we can screen a film in our courtyard. So I encourage you, bring a blanket or a low chair. Um, we'll have food and music um, with that. That film begins at about 8.30 when the sun goes down. So if you're interested, go online. We have all, the entire schedule is up. So we hope to see you back. So with that, I want to introduce uh, Kenneth Helphand. He is the Philip H. Knight Professor of Landscape Architecture. Uh, he's emeritus at the U of O, where he's taught courses in landscape history, theory, and design since 1974. He's a graduate of Brandeis University and the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He's the recipient of Distinguished Teaching Awards from the U of O, as well as the Council of Educators in Landscape Architecture. He's the author of many articles um, on landscape uh, history and theory, including uh, Colorado, Visions of an American Landscape, Dreaming Gardens, Landscape Architecture and the Making of Modern Israel, and Defiant Gardens, Making Gardens in Wartime, which sounds really interesting. Um, he is currently working on a book on the landscape architect Lawrence Halperin, which I'm sure many of you um, know about. He, um, is, was an, he served as editor of Landscape Journal. Um, he's been the recipient of the Bradford Williams Medal, a Graham Foundation grant, and finally, he was the former chair of the Senior Fellows in Garden and Landscape Studies at Dumbarton Oaks in DC. So we, we have a very distinguished speaker with us. Please join me in welcoming Kenneth Helphand. When this went on, I noticed a bunch of people saying, oh, I've been there, I've been there. I remember that one, I've been there. And, and other people I heard them think, I wonder what the hell that is. <coughs> uh, thank you for that. Uh, first, I'd actually like to thank the museum for bringing such a wonderful exhibit uh, to Portland. And I assume everyone here has seen the Tuileries exhibit uh, in the museum. I've seen it several times. Each time I, I notice more things. This time, just about an hour ago, I noticed in the film a goat grazing in the Tuileries. I hadn't seen that the first time. Uh, I'd also like to thank you to come at, coming out here on a hot you know, uh, weekend afternoon because we're in big conflict at 2 o'clock with the Flaming Lips concert down by the river. <clears throat> and I know most of you were planning on attending that. <clears throat> uh, how many of you have been to one or one of, there were three previous lectures in this series. How many have been at least, at least one? Oh, well, to two? To three? Okay. Oh, okay. You get continuing education credit. <clears throat> and, and who here has been to Paris? Okay, 
Good. <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, my topic is Par Paris Parks Now, and I emphasize all three parts of that. It's about Paris, uh, it's about parks, and it's about things that are contemporary, things that are new. Uh, but we, first, we need to step back a bit. Uh, from its origins, that's not supposed to happen. That's supposed to happen. Good. <clears throat> from its origins along the Seine, uh, Paris begins on the island, the Isle of Cité, where the uh, Notre Dame is. Uh, Paris has grown in concentric fashion. And at each stage, as it's grown, like other European uh, cities, it extends its boundaries. Essentially, its walls expand. So this is Paris in 1615. You can dramatically see the wall on, on literally on the right bank, on the right bank of the river. Um, by, six, uh, by 1705, you can see it's expanding even more in concentric fashion. And if you've been monitoring the Tuileries, the Tuileries are right there. Here's the, the Seine, obviously, the Cité. And again, dramatically, the wall surrounding the city. Um, this continues here in 1805, then in 1866. And in almost dendrological fashion, the city begins to expand. And again, just note the, the location of the Tuileries in that. At each of these different phases, open spaces emerge. Uh, but you don't really have true public parks in European or really any other cities until the 19th century. But many places functioned in the manner of public parks, precursors to their modern use. One such site, obviously, was the Tuileries, which, as you know when you've been to the exhibit, began its life as a palace garden. At its, its inception, though, the Tuileries was the edge of town. You see that dramatically when you walk down the stairway here uh, to the lower portion of the exhibit. <clears throat> It was, part, it was, in fact, literally the, the edge of town. But over its uh, half millennium, really, of existence, the, the Tuileries was designed, redesigned, destroyed, and rebuilt. And you've heard about, a bit about that in previous lectures. Uh, but it has now become, really, one of the, this is it, in the 18th century, but it has now essentially become one of the great public parks of Paris. Um, and you've seen different parts of that, the Mayot sculptures. It, in different seasons here, winter, spring, summer, and so on. Mm -hmm. It has also gone through a series of changes. And if you look at the Google Maps and you look at uh, the aerial photograph uh, of the Tuileries, you see the most recent changes, especially these kind of diagonal lines coming out from near the Louvre, which are the most recent changes uh, in the Tuileries. I thought it would be helpful to be a bit comparative. That's the Tuileries on the bottom. That's the park blocks on the top. This is the same scale. Okay? The length of the, the park blocks, or these park blocks, they are, are essentially the same, almost exactly the same as the length of the Tuileries. Not their width, but their length. And I think it's helpful to think of things that way. Okay? There are other places in Paris that have a similar provenance. The Luxembourg Gardens, like the Tuileries, had its origins as a palace garden. The, and you see that here. Or the Parc Monceau, beautiful park, northwestern portion of Paris, originally was the property of Philippe d'Orléans, my French, pardon any French problems I may have, <coughs> Philippe d'Orléans, uh, who was Louis XIV's Louis the cousin. But it's in the 19th century that Paris undergoes its great transformation that shapes much of the core of the city that we know today. Under Emperor Napoleon III, Baron Hausmann, cuts boulevards through the city. You see a diagram of those. And if you think American urban renewal was a catastrophe, this was even more so. But the result was the Grand Boulevards, places like the Champs-Elysees that you see here. But Hausmann also enforced standard building codes and with Jean Alphand as his engineer and landscape designer, transformed the two great forest parks on the east and western portion of Paris into the Bois de Vincennes, transformed it from a, a French forest park essentially into an English garden that you see today, uh, and on the western side of Paris, transformed the Bois de Boulogne, again from a French forest park, into a grand, essentially, English garden. And these kind of sit on the eastern and western sides outside the historic walls of Paris. Alphand also designed other places, many places. His signature design was one of Paris's great parks, the Parc de Bouchemont, one of the city's most unique sites. It was built on the site of a quarry uh, and disused dump land, uh, and it's rather remarkable in its appearance. Importantly, though, and less recognized, is the fact that they together created scores of smaller parks and squares, also standardized the design of streets, 
the lights, the street furniture, the benches, the tree grates, uh, and the now defunct pissoirs that used to be around Paris. Uh, it's these details that in fact create the look of continuity of what we think of as modern Paris. The next great transformation of public spaces in Paris would have to wait for over a century. Uh, Paris has the tradition of the grand project, the great project, uh, but it's most often associated with buildings, like the opera, the library, the museum, uh, but it's also about great public open spaces. So it's those that I want to focus on. And in the past generation, Paris has been an innovative hub in European and really world landscape design. But they're not alone. Barcelona has done remarkable designs, and recently Oslo, for example. But of course, Paris is Paris, so people look to it and visit it. Uh, before we do that, though, there's another one of those standard designs. A comparison again. That's Portland, that's Paris. Same exact scale in Google Earth. Portland has a little over 600,000 people. Paris has about four times as many, a little over two million people. The density of Paris, of Portland's a little over 4,000 people a square mile. Paris, almost 55,000 people per square mile. It's, one, it's about number 30 in the top of the world's densest cities. So if we're making comparisons, and I think it's important to, to think about what can happen in Portland and things we might learn from Paris, realize the density is 10 times as much. Okay? It may not feel that way, which is one of the remarkable things uh, about the city. <clears throat> Just another kind of more closer kind of example. Uh, there are other telling statistics. Uh, we could, in Portland, have you know, coffee shops per square mile. Uh, they could have cafes per square mile. Okay. <clears throat> uh, but for the past 30 years, Paris has reasserted its role as a center of landscape architecture design innovation. There's a series of grand new parks, and they're neighbor named here, and open spaces that have been constructed. And I'm going to focus on kind of large open spaces. There's also been a great deal of work in smaller spaces, but I'm going to look at these large spaces. Several of these parks, as we'll see, were the result of international design competitions, and therefore they've received great uh, attention uh, and many of those acclaim, as we'll see. I'm going to look at these actually in chronological order uh, as we go through this. But first, maybe a last look at the Tuileries, because when the last redesign of the Tuileries, the area around the carousel in proximity to the Louvre was done, there was a competition. And one of the competition entries was by a great French landscape designer and architect, a man named Bernard Lesseus. And he proposed what you see here. And his proposal was in recognition that the Tuileries, in fact, as you've heard in other lectures, is built upon historical layers. He suggested subdividing the contemporary Tuileries into different historical later layers and reconstructing each of those layers. So you'd have a 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th century Tuileries, and that's what these kind of colored areas here referred to. It was really more of a conceptual idea. They obviously did not do that, but it's a fascinating concept. So by the mid 20th century, Paris, like other historic cities, essentially was built out. In other words, there was no open land left in the core of the city within the area of the historic walls. <clears throat> um, but despite that, and, and actually despite its illustrious history of open space designs, there was actually a shortage of park space in Paris. But times and economies changed, so opportunities were created. All the parks we're going to look at were parks of opportunity. They take advantage of sites that no longer serve their original economic function, so defunct rail yards and rail lines, abandoned warehouses, slaughterhouses, factories, areas slated for demolition, were grasped upon as opportunities to enrich Paris's open space. They also presented opportunities for innovative design. Yet as you'll see, they, I think in many ways, all follow certain classic tra uh, traditions in French garden design, in their geometry, their bold geometries, their grand axes, their use of pools of water, a use of great variety within a constructed geometric order, and a rather dramatic horticultural tradition. The first of these is the Parc de la Valette. <clears throat> You're looking here, the edge of the walls of the city, in the late 19th century, all these little rectangular boxes with the slaughterhouses of the city of Paris. And by the late, by the, really the mid 20th century, this site was now uh, not used any longer. <clears throat> so the site for the Parc de la Valette became this site. It's in the northeast corner of Paris, adjacent to no longer the wall, but the peripheral boulevard, uh, the belt line essentially that now 
goes around the city of Paris. It was the site of the great abattoir, the great slaughterhouses. It's also at the junction, as you see there, of two canals, the Canal Saint-Denis and the Canal Saint-Martin. Um, and competitors, this was the subject of an international competition, had to uh, respond to a set of characteristics. That location here in the city, the canals, the northern half of the site, which by when it was when the park was done was the site of what was called a city of science and industry, which was a great science, like Smithsonian Museum. Uh, in the southern ha half, a great hall was uh, left over for conversion, for events, and the site also had to include a long list of things in its program, a city of music, uh, elements for the neighborhood, a garden including a garden of the planets, among other things. And at the north and southern end of the site were metro stops. The task was not modest. This was a great project for the French. Uh, the French wanted, they said, and this is a quote, they wanted the model park for the 21st century. And the competition was around 1980. The competition attracted over 500 entrants, entrants from around the world. I know it very well because I was part of a team of people at the U of O who entered. Uh, we did not win. <clears throat> we did get in the book. <laughs> and the exhibit, though. <laughs> okay. um, the winner, though, was a man named Bernard Chumi, who was a French-Swiss architect. And his proposal was an overlay of elements, a deceptively simple geometric idea of overlaying points, lines, and spaces, but making each point, each line, each space distinctive. Uh, and these are part of his diagrams that show that. <clears throat> but if you look at the park today, which you see there in the air photo on the right, and the plan of the park there on the, uh, on the left, and the plan of the park on the right, it's based on this simple idea of a set of points, a set of lines, and a set of spaces, and what happens if you just sandwich them together? Almost think of them independently. What happens when you just overlay them? So just briefly looking at the parts. The points were a series of garden follies. There's a great tradition of follies in gardens. He resurrected that as these little constructivist architectural monuments, all red, all with a different function. Some are just landmarks in the park. Others are observatories, viewpoints, cafes, exhibits. They're dramatic architectural mar <coughs> markers, and they are, in fact, equally dispersed as a grid uh, throughout the park, as you see here. And literally, where they fell is where they fell. Sometimes it's a whole thing, sometimes it's a fragment, but all these dramatic red elements. The lines in the park are the grand axes, very much in a classic French vocabulary. Um, you see here this kind of wavy line of a long, essentially, promenade that connect the northern part of the park to the southern part of the park and the two metro stations along there. Um, there's alleys, in, again, in the classic French garden tradition, striking their way through the park, but here done in a very contemporary manner. Uh, the canals themselves became great lines in the park, reinforced by both alleys and, again, walkways, including a raised walkway which took you up a little bit in this, in fact, flat uh, landscape. And there are grand open spaces also inscribed in the park for gatherings, gatherings and recreation. There are other elements. Another line Shumi, Shumi added to the park wasn't a straight one, but a kind of wavy line that looked like that, which he called the cinegram folly, the, the, the cinematic or movie folly. And along this kind of amorphous loop, he connected a series of theme gardens, some designed by him, some designed by others. Most fascinating is one known as the Bamboo Garden, which was constructed as a garden beneath the surface of the park, and then it in fact revealed things like the gas lines, the electric lines, et cetera, uh, that were subterranean, and let those be part, in fact, part of the design. But there's also a garden related to sound. That would be the one on the right that kind of talks to you as you walk through it. There's the Garden of Mirrors, and in fact, about a dozen more of these places. They were the winner of the competition. But there were other entries that were rather revealing, and I'm not going to go through these. The most famous, often in competitions, it's the second prize that gets noted more in history. And this one, for designers, is particularly significant by a group called the Office of Metropolitan Architecture, headed by the Dutch architect Rem Koolhaas, as some of you may know. But they also came from all the continents. There were Japanese examples, Brazilian examples, and so on, which were just some rather wild, as you see here. But critically, what happened was the competition sparked discussion about both its design and thinking, but more importantly, about the role of parks in the city. For this was not, intentionally was not a piece of rural nature in the city. It was a very urban design. Uh, and like the open spaces of earlier years, in fact, 
spawned a great deal of development uh, at its periphery along its edges. So this was the beginning of a much larger system, park system, for at least this quarter of Paris. So La Valette here is this little kind of thing in the kind of northeast portion, but all along that canal and going all the way down to the Seine, it sparked the development of new parks, new open spaces, new housing, new commerce, et cetera, uh, in a string, all catalyzed really by this development. And again, that's the Parc de La Valette, that's the park blocks. Um, the La Valette's about 120 acres, uh, this portion of the city is about the same. <clears throat> the second one of these I want to look at is the Parc Citroën. It opened in 1992, but from 1915, and the Parc Citroën is this little green rectangle, it's not little, but this green rectangle that you see there uh, along the Seine. <clears throat> you see it in more detail there. From 1915 until the 1970s, this was the location of the automobile, the Citroën factory. It's about 60 acres in size, about twice the size of Laurelhurst Park, if you want a Portland comparison. Uh, and you see it here, its location here, more dramatically along the Seine. It's part of this great series of open spaces along, uh, along the left bank of the, 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 part of the Champ de Mars by the, uh, by the Eiffel Tower, the Jardin de Plant, the Tuileries on the right bank, and so on. The product, the, the design, though, was the product, and I should just let me point out, right, because I just noticed this in the exhibit, they erected, it was to be temporary, a balloon, which you kind of go up a little ways and they pull you down, one of those, uh, as an ascension. And they did that as a temporary thing, and it turns out it's been so popular they've left that. And obviously, if you've been to the exhibit, you see that the Tuileries was the site of some of the first balloon ascensions uh, in the 18th century. So it's actually continuing a, a French, uh, let's say, or aeronautical tradition if you will, okay, semi or aeronautical, okay. Um, so it's this grand space here leading down to the Seine like other grand spaces along the Seine, the Tuileries, the Jardin de Plant, the Champ de Mars uh, of the Eiffel Tower that you see in the distance. In the plan, in fact, this uh, design was the product also of a competition and in a very unusual turn of events, uh, there was a first place winner and the second prize winner and the judges liked certain things about the first place and a lot of things about the second. They put the teams together, which is rather unusual, uh, and they actually worked together to create the final scheme. In the final scheme, what you see is this grand rectangle, going green rectangle going down to the river. Uh, in the upper portions, these two squares, known as the black square and the white square, which are associated with new housing and neighborhoods that lead then uh, into, it, that into the park. So the park was also then part of a neighborhood transformation. So these two squares, you see them here, the white square and the black square, the white square and black garden, sorry, um, are part of these adjoining neighborhoods. Um, and the park design is again in this grand French tradition. So there's this huge, large open space sloping up from the Seine and a grand, a rather grand diagonal walkway that cuts straight across the park that you see there. Okay. <clears throat> Um, at the upper level of this grand space are two conservatories, two greenhouses. One houses a tropical garden, the other houses a desert garden inside. And between those two uh, greenhouses, essentially, there's a fountain grid, a play fountain that is found in many parks, in many places. On one side of the park are grand, large reflecting pools, much like Lenotre's designs, and on the opposite side, a series of innovative gardens. These gardens, by a man named Gilles Clément, are experienced, in fact, at several levels, literally several levels. <clears throat> As you see here, there's a walkway along that looks down to these, uh, to these series of gardens. This is what this walkway looked like when the park was new. This is exactly what it looked like only about 10 years later, when you're walking through, essentially, the tree canopy. Okay. <clears throat> and there they are in comparison. This is the same place. It's a little reminder that landscapes grow. <laughs> Plants grow, as I tell my students all the time. Okay. okay. From these walkways, or from below, you look down at a series of gardens. Okay? Um, and also in this upper walkway, there is a series of literally small greenhouses. And in one of these, you can see someone is you know, sitting with a baby carriage or just reading. It's kind of very intimate domestic scale in the middle of a major urban park. It's a rather interesting combination. But you look down at a series of gardens. There's about a dozen of these. Each garden is thematic. Each garden has plants and a concept, in fact, that is explained in a series of plaques as you look at each garden. Um, 
and it's you, kind of rather dramatic and fascinating. Uh, you might ask, would we do something like this? Not, we wouldn't, uh, unlikely. The French, in fact, have a tradition that esteems horticultural variety and excellence. So these are gardens, this is a public park, it takes an extraordinary amount of maintenance, extraordinary expense, um, but this is very much part of the idea. In Clément's idea, there was a kind of arcane uh, symbolism related to astrological signs, the seasons, plants, growth, and so on. No matter, they're really fascinating places. And again, for comparison, the Park Parks and the Parks de Troem. The third of these parks is the Parc de Bressy. Okay. <clears throat> again, the Parc de Bressy is on the top, the park blocks on the bottom almost the same length, about the size, and Bracy is about the size of the Tuileries, and like the Tuileries, is located uh, adjoining the Seine River. Okay. But here, too, this was land where the function had changed. This was the site of a series of wine warehouses, obviously significant for Paris, uh, as well as rail yards. It's near one of the rail stations for Paris. And like the Parc de la, la, la Villette and Parc Citroën, it was rather bold uh, in its design. All three of these parks were built around a grand central axis. Uh, they're all essentially symmetrical in many ways, but within that symmetry, a great variety. Brissy, I think, is closer to the Tuileries in spirit and also in design. It's the Tuileries design, you know that it's essentially a series of compartmentalized squares. Um, and Brissy is essentially that, a series of gridded squares, and like the Tuileries, it is on a plinth, it's raised above the Seine, and from it, at least it's one side, it looks over the river. At its western edge, the park has a huge sports palace, I don't have a picture of that, a huge sports palace, um, and at its eastern end, as we'll see, a complex of restaurants and exhibit pavilions, and the garden uh, is between the two. At the western end are two grand fountains, this is one that is from the walkway that abuts the Seine and then goes down in these kind of rapid, uh, you know, cascading steps uh, that take you up or down from that level. Um, and then nearby, this other one that is, creates a large canyon. Um, and as I've noted, uh, we would never allow this in the United States, uh, or at least our attorneys would never allow it in the United States. Uh, and it always kind of even scares me to look at it. It's very dramatic, and I was actually surprised that people, at least these kids, could enter it. Uh, but they were having a great time. It, I don't know what happened after I left. <laughs> I, <okay. laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know where their parents were. <laughs> okay, okay. The opposite end, the very far opposite end, is a great kind of restaurant and exhibit complex where they did a restoration of many of these wine warehouses. And it's, and it's a very, very popular place. Uh, the thing flying in the air is part of an art exhibit, not, not some acrobat and so on. Okay. Between these two ends, the restaurants and the fountains and the sports, sports complex, is a whole variety of recreational park spaces of great variety. They're small, they're large, they're intimate, they're sunny, they're shady, uh, all the things you would expect in a great, large uh, public open space. Um, and as you can see, they're used for the kind of variety of uses to which people put open spaces uh, and parks. Uh, there is a series of flower beds. There is a series of parterres. And again, these take a great deal of maintenance and a great deal of expense. Uh, I read an article when, some years ago in the New York Times, uh, and it was, you know, how come Paris, it looks so good? How come they clean the streets twice a day? How come they get mail twice a day? Uh, is they spend about eight times as much money on Paris as they do to any other city in France. Um, obviously, the rest of France doesn't particularly happy about that, uh, but it, there's the sense that Paris is Paris, and you treat it very differently. You treat it dramatically. So part of their beauty comes from what the citizens are willing to expend in this place. There's a, series, a whole series of different gardens and arbors. Uh, there's grapes, obviously, but others more floral, uh, and a great variety of spaces, as well as a great variety uh, of, horticultural, uh, of horticultural expertise. There's a daycare center that's located in this, and like all of these par parks, the area adjacent to it has developed. Uh, there's more apartments, there's more housing, there's more commerce in association to this because people want to live in adjacent to these places. The same holds true for places in Portland and virtually any place in the United States. Living aside a park or an open space uh, is desirable. There's a small mount in the park, which is very much part of a, 
of uh, Italian and then French garden design uh, history. You can climb up in spiral fashion. It gives you a chance to overlook the park, including the water garden, this kind of slightly kind of Japanese kind of water garden uh, that is part of um, this area of the park. The park, in fact, though, is bisected. There's a road that runs right, right through the middle of it. So there's a great arched bridge that takes you from one side to the other, uh, which is rather dramatic. It's like a kind of Chinese garden bridge, but much, much larger in scale. Takes you up and over, uh, and also allows you, again, to see the different parts of the park and even the traffic beneath. And if you're driving along, you see that bridge. Uh, you see that bridge as well. <clears throat> So with the completion of the Parc de la Valette, the Parc Citroën, and the Parc Brissy, these large parks, which were between, between about 60 and 120 acres, there were no large open spaces left in the city of Paris for development. And Paris wasn't allowed, about to demolish anything to make any open spaces. So like other cities in Europe, and especially in the United States as well, new possibilities was explored. And one of the most innovative is one of my favorite places, uh, the Promenade Planté which was inaugurated in 1993. And while France had not abandoned rail traffic, by f not at all, there's still great trains in France, there was an abandoned rail line that ran almost three miles from the peripheral boulevard of the city toward, excuse me, towards the Place, de la Best the Place de Bastille. And this rail line and its viaducts and tunnels, et cetera, were slated for demolition. But the idea developed to transform it, transform it into an elevated park. Well, trains, as you know, need almost level ground to operate. So to construct a rail line, if it's not on flat ground, either you create a viaduct that takes you over things that are hilly or bridges and so on, and if there's a hill or a mountain, you tunnel through it. So this, as we'll see, this park is both on a viaduct and on flat ground and runs through tunnels. So the Promenade Plante begins near the Bastille, on the left side that you see there, on top of this viaduct, the arched areas below were all converted to restaurants, cafes, artist workshops, uh, galleries. It was a kind of specific uses were designated for that. There are a series of steps or elevators that take you up, up to the park, uh, which is then a raised promenade. Um, and the name is important, and the name is taken seriously. Um, it is the Promenade Ponte, and it is a place exactly to do that, to promenade, a place to walk, a place to survey the promenade that you're on, a place to survey the scenery, a place to look at the city from the third, essentially second to third story level. You're in the canopy of the trees, you look across to buildings, even into windows alongside of it. Um, and the feeling in a promenade, like your fellow walkers, that you're parading along this place. Um, and along this continuous walkway, there are in fact another series, a series of gardens. There's a rose garden, there are places to sit, there's arbors, there's niches. Um, there's, again, a kind of great floral display. There's other gardens, like the one lower right-hand corner, that you look down upon, and all this then was built connecting into the existing neighborhood tissue, the existing fabric of the streets that were previously there. Along the way, there's a great linear, water, a great linear lavender water garden that you see there is rather stunning in all seasons, and particularly stunning uh, when the lavender is flowering. The, the, the smell is just, uh, is just, in fact, extraordinary as you walk along through this. And again, it's a reminder of this uh, horticultural uh, tradition that's so much, part, uh, so much part of the French garden. At one point, one point the promenade slices through a building. Um, in fact, it didn't slice through the building. They built the building around it to look like it did slice through the building. <laughs> but it does give you that illusion that it's kind of just sliced through uh, this portion, uh, portion of the city. <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay. Um, in addition, this promenade now passes. This is where it kind of hits grade and it steps up through these series of terrace gardens and walkways. But then it starts to hit grade and an entirely new neighborhood was built around it in this portion of the city. And a great bridge now takes you uh, as the promenade continues, it takes you over a great a new garden. Uh, the garden that you see here, the garden that, de, de, uh, I can never say that word, Ruyi, something like that, which is a large circular space which you view from this arch bridge as you walk over it, which I think in many ways is the kind of model of just what a large piece of grass can do. 
Um, and many of you have been to France and Paris where there's signs, you know, keep off the grass, keep off the grass. We're just supposed to look at the grass. You know, here, in fact, it's just the opposite. Um, here, in fact, you're invited to be on it, um, and people use it in dramatic ways. And actually, I always like to show this particular slide to my students, because you see these people kind of lined up in the shadow of the arch. Uh, as I watched them for a while, as it was a hot day. As the shadow moved, they moved themselves in the blanket. You, know? you always want to have a sunny space and a, and a shady place in a garden. And here, people were moving <laughs> with it. Around this space, though, there is a great walkway surrounding this circular space. And on this ring walk, as you circumnavigate it, there is a series of children's play areas, um, there's other, there's a cafe, of course, you have to have a cafe, um, and then there's even a constructed wetland that's part of this. So you can watch, and I have watched kids, you know, you know catch bugs um, in the midst of Paris. You know, it's rather wonderful. After the bridge continues, the promenade, in fact, hits grade and passes through an area of new housing. Then it goes on, as you see here, <clears throat> and this is part of that new housing. Then, in fact, it goes through the series of tunnels and bridges that were part of the old rail line. You can see the embankments. You're now kind of cut away down into the earth. Uh, and at this point, it becomes a promenade, not just for, for people walking, but also a bike path. So there's both bikes and pedestrians here. There's a series of art projects in the niches underneath the tunnels that you see here. They're lit up. The park, in fact, uh, portions of it close at nighttime. And actually, it's, it's well policed. Um, you go along, there's the requisite parterre. You couldn't have a French garden without a parterre. And this one has a little stair you walk up so you could just kind of look down at it. Um, and then the promenade continues all the way, ultimately leading underneath the peripheral boulevard of the city of Paris into the Bois de Vincennes, that park, great park to the east that was designed by Alfond uh, and Hausmann. Uh, the promenade planté, in fact, was the inspiration explicitly for the well-known High Line project that some of you know in New York City, built on that elevated uh, rail line uh, on the west side of southwest Manhattan, and the explicit uh, inspiration for the now under construction Bloomingdale line uh, in the city of Chicago. And I mention that one as a plug because my son in Chicago is president of the Friends of the Bloomingdale line in Chicago. <laughs> okay. And of course has been here. In addition to these grand projects, there are many smaller ones, but they're no less imaginative. Uh, this is the Jardin d'Atlantique, and it's this space that you see there. Um, this is also built on an opportunistic site. The opportunistic site was the air rights over the tracks leading to the Gare Montparnasse, the railroad station on the north side of Paris. And it's called the Jardin Atlantique because trains from this station go to western France and the Atlantic Ocean, and the garden abstracts the Atlantic Ocean. So the center of the garden, the big green area, is a symbolic Atlantic. And surrounding it are symbolic elements representing essentially the land surfaces of uh, essentially of, of Europe, Africa, South and North America uh, that surround the Atlantic. So as you walk around it, there are allusions to the Copacabana Beach in Rio. And it's kind of great sinuous mosaic that people are familiar with. Uh, there are allusions to the Atlas Mountains in North Africa that are there. There are very specific plant choices related to those, uh, those continents, really. There's a children's playground that, of course, has a boat as if you're on, uh, in the middle of the ocean. The center, in fact, is a meteorological station uh, that continuously monitors the weather, of course, as you might want to do if you were on a boat. Um, the center, this great grass area, is these series of slow, kind of low raised uh, wavy terraces of grass, but you see the gray areas between them. Those gray areas between them are, in fact, the air vents for the trains underneath it. <laughs> so if you kind of stand over them, you kind of you know, hear trains rumbling underneath. This is all built essentially on air rights. You know, it's a, it's a, a kind of great, great roof garden, uh, if you will. And then on one side, far side, is this decked area and the illusion there is if you're on the deck of a great ocean liner crossing the ocean. Okay. These are largely images, actually, from the winter. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the place I've shown uh, have, are all built. Some are the oldest is about 30 years old, uh, the other about the last, and even more recently. Uh, in all of these places, the plants are maturing, as you saw dramatically at, at Parc Citroën. 
people are, are responding to their designs and assigning new uses to many of these places. But I want to talk about another kind of open space that's becoming increasingly more common uh, and important in, in the modern city. Uh, and these are temporary spaces. Uh, but I think paradoxically, because they're temporary, their impact in many ways may even be greater. And there's two of these. <clears throat> the first of these is the Paris Plage, which means the Paris Beach. Uh, and every summer, since 2002, for one month in the summer, a portion of the right bank of the Seine that the rest of the year is a highway is converted into an urban beach. Um, it's announced by the great banners that you see here, these blue banners. Um, and along this, there's a raised area uh, that has been filled with sand, as you see there, uh, and the accoutrements of a beach. Okay? There's a boardwalk, there's chairs, there's umbrellas, there's palm trees, there's allusions to being in the south of France. Uh, the space here is all, in fact, first come, first serve, uh, just like a true beach. You know, that's my spot, my blanket, and so on. Uh, but there are a few things that are different. This is France. So, Pails and shovels, you can't bring your own. They provide them. Mm -hmm. And they provide them in certain colors. I'm not exaggerating here. Okay. Nor can you bring your own chair or blanket. Okay. Nor can you bring your own food, which surprised me there. Uh, but there are other variety of opportunities. As you see here, a huge variety of places to lie down in addition to the sand and the walkway. There are a variety of places to sit kind of, you know, great chairs and these other kind of lounging things, and these are just example, but people use it and participate in it as if they're on the beach. So kids dig in the sand, they make, uh, you know, sand castles, there are, in addition, water play areas, there's misters for hot days, there's children's play areas, there's cafes, of course, there's ice cream and ices, uh, there are itinerant musicians, you can get a massage, uh, and, of course, you can play bull. Okay? And in fact, this project has spawned other urban beaches, and this is not the only city that's done this. Oh, this is, watched a movie the other night which took place in Hamburg, uh, and Hamburg has beaches opposite their dock, docks. It's rather extraordinary. But it's spawned in Paris beaches and other parts of the city, including a grand one along the basin of La Villette, near that park. Um, but in the midst of the city, urban in the midst of the city, urban behavior becomes beach behavior. Um, and in fact, several million, no exaggeration, visit the Paris Plaza each summer. So just, just the other day, literally the other day, reading the New York Times, I read about this project, Le Berger des Seine, which is the newest of these river projects. It's built on the left bank of the Seine, near the Musée d'Orsay, for those of you who know that. And it is built along a roadway. This one, though, is permanent. It is the roadway will be taken away, and part of this park is built on a series of floating barges in the river. So you have a series of gardens like Bercy and these other places, these theme and, and uh, Park Citroën, thematic gardens, but each of these barges now becomes a garden that you walk, can walk onto. And those, of course, will change, because you can go from one to the next. Uh, the bottom, draw bottom is a kind of drawing of what the park ultimately will look like, and you see on the top there's even this kind of large map, world map one can... Uh, descend upon to. Okay. The last project I want to tell you about was a one-day event. This is really temporary. It happened on Bastille Day in the year 2000, the millennium. Okay. Uh, on that day, all of France's mayors, all 10,000 of them, were invited to a celebration in the Luxembourg Gardens. So you walked around the city and there were all these mayors with a tree color sash walking around. And you could have been the, the you know, the, I, trying to think, you know, the mayor of Coburg, which is right by Eugene, and you were there equal with the mayor of Marseille in Paris. Every single mayor was there, small or large. But what happened in the city that day was the culmination of a year-long project that they called the Green Meridian. Uh, and the Green Meridian is the line of longitude that runs north-south through France uh, through the Paris Observatory. It's like the, the, the prime meridian that runs through Greenwich in England. Okay. Uh, and you can see there, in fact, the map of it was on the ground, and it is this line, and the French map things historically uh, related to that. So along this line, for the year leading up to uh, Bastille Day 2000, uh, there was a series of projects, largely green projects, environmental projects, that included planting thousands and thousands of trees in the communities along that line. Not necessarily on the line, but in the communities along that line. But on Bastille Day, they held a picnic for the country. 
Okay, literally, a picnic for the country, which they called the Incredible Picnic. Uh, and what you're looking at there on the left was a brochure you got all over France and all over Paris the days before. It was a guide to everything that was happening on that picnic, on that day, in all of these communities, all through France. And of course, being France, there was also recipes. <laughs> and there's suggestions of what you should bring to the picnic, because it wasn't, this was not hot dogs and hamburgers. <laughs> I don't think I saw a hot dog and hamburger the whole time, at least for the picnic part. Okay, they do love hamburgers, in fact. Okay, um, so what happened in, on this day in these communities, I saw it on the news later that day, there was picnic tables running across fields, through villages. Uh, it, was, it was rather extraordinary. But what happened in Paris was from the peripheral boulevard in the north to the peripheral boulevard in the south, they erected tables on sawhorses and plywood and so on. There were tables that went the entire length of the city. When it hit a park, it was along you know, uh, green spaces, along the lawn, uh, et cetera. It ran the entire length. Um, people picnicked. Of course, Badois, the bottled water company, they supplied the checkered tablecloths uh, that you see there. I own about 10 feet of one I got. Um, and it was announced uh, what should people should do. Uh, and this was France, of course, and in fact, a great picnic occurred. So on these tables on city streets, uh, at one point on a bridge over the Seine, right over the Seine, people were there. There were songbooks that were distributed, much like the recent songbooks, if you were here for the 30th anniversary of the Community Sing in Pioneer Square. How many people were there for that? It was just an extraordinary thing with these little songbooks for several hours, people singing folk songs and songs from musicals and so on. There was thousands of people in the square. All ages, it was wonderful. The same thing, people was happening here. People were jumping up and singing La Marseillaise and French folk songs and so on. Okay. Um, so it seems fitting, maybe for a final, final image of, of this presentation, uh, to look at a picnic. The picnic is on the Pont d'Arts, which is the pedestrian bridge that goes across the Seine that links the Louvre, which loaned virtually most of the work that you see upstairs, uh, to the left bank, which is the side of the Willamette that we sit on. Um, and I conclude with that. Thank you. I will glad, could lights come on? Oh, lights come, hey, that's good. <clears throat> uh, I gladly answer any questions about these places, who did them, why they did them, what are they like now, Which, where the best cafe is. Yes, far back. Uh, do you have any feeling for whether some of these parks are more popular than others with the public? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, some of the, they're, they're, I mean, some of it depends on location. Uh, you're in certain locations, clearly at the core of the city. Uh, you know, the, which, like the Tuileries at the core of the city or the Brescias at the core of the city, where just the, the local population is so large that people are going to be using them. Others, like La Villette, which is, is closer to the periphery, some have become tourist attractions. People go to, I was talking to someone earlier, are you going to talk about Parc Citroën? Because they went there as a tourist, it's well known. Uh, others, they are also all heavily programmed, like large municipal parks in this country. There are events in them, all seasons. Summer, there are, there's going to be an outdoor film showing, they do outdoor film showing, they do, do music, they do artistic events. Uh, yes, in all of them. Like most urban places, uh, spring, and you know, spring, summer, and fall, they're more populated than the winter, but all of these parks also have places that are on the inside, um, places that you would go to and to enjoy them. There's um, much less a... a Okay. In this country, we seem to think that commerce ought to be in one place and then kind of, we don't want to kind of spoil particularly any place that's green and open with something as profane as commerce. Uh, the Europeans don't have that attitude at all. Uh, in fact, my God, how could you have a park without a cafe? You know, it's, it's, it's uncivilized. It's like going hiking in Switzerland when you get on the top of the mountain, there's a bench. That's not an exaggeration, actually. <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. The plan, the, these are not willy-nilly, willy just some commercial developer buying something. Um, France, Paris especially, has very strict regulations about heights of buildings, about density, 
uh, about actually income distribution, um, all of that, and, and about open space that needs to be provided uh, within those places, about commerce, uh, particularly at street level, and the, and the provision of that. Yes, all of those things were part of a, a lar the, the larger, you know, the larger city planning uh, practice. And I think it's important to recognize that why I'm talking about park planning, and, and many of you have been to kind of these other uh, conversation groups uh, about Portland, that you can't look at open space and park planning without looking at it uh, in the larger context uh, of planning of the city, of housing, of commerce, transportation, uh, et cetera. Yes, so it's a good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll be around a little bit after. Anybody? There are, oh, by the way, I should say, I was emphasizing large spaces. There's also another kind of grain of things in Paris, places in Paris, uh, much smaller, kind of smaller squares, smaller open spaces, many associated with housing that are as equally uh, innovative uh, and, and exciting. So uh, go home and just buy tickets. <laughs>